Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So hi everybody, how you doing? <laughs> Are you all smiles? You had a good set. So you need to uh, let me know how you did this week. Did you do okay? Yeah, everybody shaking their heads, smiling this week, using your smiles. So we're going to just go in and we are going to um, take a look at the Eightfold Path. And I decided to go into one of the summaries I did on this. And um, I spent a lot of time a couple of years back, a few years back, trying to figure out how to give this to you in a way that was short, 27 kg, yeah, <laughs> that's pretty good, okay? And um, it was in, actually put into one paragraph, but today I put it into a line of eight pieces, but if you squeeze it together, you still have it in one paragraph. So I'm going to go over the Eightfold Path with you, and we're going to talk about how you're using the Eightfold Path and what you're doing with it in life, because this is what's really important. Reading the stuff or reading the suttas about it is one thing. However, the big question is, are you checking up on your Eightfold Path? Are you checking in every once in a while to see if you are fulfilling the Eightfold Path and how you are using it in life is what is most important. When, <clears throat> excuse me, when people come and they're teaching Buddhism and everything, it's great if the teachers are here and we're teaching you if the Buddha came, if someone else comes and is teaching, you have a great teacher come through. But when that person goes, what happens afterwards? that legacy for that person is up to you. And just like learning Buddhism, we don't want to have it isolated. We want to have it integrated. We want to have it as part of our life. And so that is probably the most important thing that we want to work for. And we think in, in you know, Dhammasukha, we think basically that TWIM is a really good way to do this because it's small and succinct, it's clear, and because you can take it in your pocket, take it to work, use it all the time, okay? So I'd like to see your faces while we do this, if it's possible for everybody to let me see people. <laughs> it would be good, it would be fun for this, just to see how everybody's doing while we go through this. It's not that long. Let's see if I can get it up for you. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> I sent this through to you, May, to pass on to people. I didn't send it. Okay, good. So what this is, a summary. I did this first back in 2009. And the summary of this is, um, it's really, um, let's see if I can make this work. Yeah, I can. Okay. So I'm going to read through it, and then we'll go back through it. Okay. So if we just read through it as if it was a paragraph. It's an exercise in how the Eightfold Path works and where it leads to. So the first part, the art of living begins through selfless, harmonious perspective of whatever is happening in life. To see things clearly, we need to stop taking things personally. It's a message you see, in, and then it says, it helps us to bring up and keep wholesome imaging in your mind, in your mind, okay? We must learn how to investigate further and perfect a harmonious communication to ourselves first and to others via their own thoughts, your own thoughts, words, and deeds, how you do this. And they need to watch how mind's attention impersonally moves about without our asking it to. That's what we need to discover. Number four, we must discover the value of encouraging a more harmonious movement of mind's attention, okay? The fifth one is by taking things less personally and letting things go more easily, 
you will reduce stress in life. Tension and stress will, you know, slow down and to dissolve and develop a more harmonious lifestyle. Everything we do in life has to do with how we apply ourselves, how we're able to have clear thinking, how we are able to stay in the present time on one event at a time, okay? And so having a harmonious lifestyle, all of these parts of the Eightfold Path are contributing to that. Number six, our, as our smile begins to return, we will feel more confident and we are encouraged to pursue harmonious practice all the time that the Buddha called right effort. And by establishing this kind of right striving, we are releasing unwholesome tension tension filled mind states and we are relaxing and then smiling replacing them with more wholesome calmer mind states and we are then keeping these going with whatever we are doing number seven is gradually we will notice how all phenomena impersonally arise and pass away Perfecting this skilled, harmonious observation allows us to notice how to see clearly the true nature of how life works for real. Most people don't get to see this. Most people don't meet this kind of, of examination of how everything works, and they don't get to go back to nature to see how impersonally it all flows. Okay. Gradually, we will achieve equanimity by balancing a softer, harmonious collectedness of mind, which in turn will lead us to abandoning snap reactions in life and replace these with more peaceful responses instead. There's a lot of study going on by some of the poly scholars in the last couple of years of getting to this point of understanding where we can just say to the modern day person, you know, what we're doing is showing you how, from the Buddhist perspective, we can take reactions and turn them into more peaceful responses that are dealing with the present time. The entire path is applied by forgiving everything, applying compassion and loving kindness to all that we do in our life. And in essence, we are naturally shifting from war to peace on the smallest scale ourselves, affecting everything to the largest scale, the world. So change happens due to personal experience and clear understanding. Uh, and newly applied mental, verbal, and physical actions. See, it was this that led the Bodhisattva through the doorway to peace, and his offering to us includes the promise of an eventual end of soul suffering if we very closely follow what he did in his investigation, and we repeat it following his guidelines. That's just where it started. Now, I want to go back to the top of this, and I want to show you something. In this particular one, you know, <clears throat> we were making back then, and this is like 2007, 2006, 7, 8, like that. We were making a lot of charts and things. And, uh, you know, we want to show you where the old titles and the new titles are sitting, just in case you haven't picked up on it. But the first one is Right View. And in order to have right view of things, if you look at the suttas and read them through and understand what they're saying, you're looking for harmony. Harmony. Everything is looking through harmony. That is what is uh, the most important thing. Instead of disharmony, we're looking for harmony. We're looking for balance. Instead of tension and tightness, we're looking for calm and quietude and, you know, staying in the present time instead of the past or in the future with the past remorse or lamentation about the past to spending time worrying constantly about what's coming next in the future when the future isn't here yet. It doesn't mean you don't plan for the future. I want to make this perfectly clear. Okay, it doesn't mean you don't sit down in the present time and decide to spend an hour looking at the potential for the future 
or making plans for the future, laying out a plan for college, laying out a plan for anything, doesn't mean you don't do that, okay? It just means that you don't constantly drift away at work, thinking and worrying constantly about the future and not functioning in the present time. That's really what it's talking about. Okay, so this one was right view, and all of the parts of right view are fulfilled if we have a harmonious perspective. And the perspective we're talking about that he's emphasizing throughout the text is attempting to experiment personally with life to see whether it's more successful if you take everything as if it's me, it's mine, it's myself, therefore I'm to blame and it's my burden and everything you start thinking is happening to me if we think it's all about me. But if we were to turn it around and say simply what if, and this is how I want you to approach it, not because I tell you or the Buddha tells you even, he wants you to experience by saying, what if I look at it a different way? What if I don't take things personally and immediately get on the defensive in an interaction with people? And instead I try to look and watch and see what is essential and what is unessential. So this would be talking about right view and all the parts of right view. You can find a lot of that um, within certain suttas in the text and you'll find out what's happening is he's talking about harmony instead of disharmony and the results of reacting in, in, instead of responding. He's showing you what happens to you. Okay, the second one is about harmonious imaging. And we I've said wholesome here because I just wanted to really stress this is the wholesome imaging. And today, you know, that can be a real sore spot if we don't carry the right images in our mind during the day. And anything that we're doing, we have to uh, be the only one that can be in charge of what's in our mind all the time. You set this up. And for those who haven't been here before, we have to remember something. The neural, sci neural cognitive science and everything has proven now, about 12 years ago it was, they proved beyond any shadow of a doubt that the brain is not locked in place. You are not stuck. I, I think this is fun. Nobody can say to me, but I'm stuck. Because you're not stuck anymore. Because now we know exactly how you can change your behavioral patterns. And one of the Pali scholars at the University of Paradinia in Sri Lanka, he did a research and what he came up with was that uh, bhavana usually is translated as development of mind. But he said, you know, it's acceptable for you to say development of behavior patterns because that is what happens when you develop your mind in the Buddhist way. You start to change your behavior patterns, okay? So that's um, one of the things about imaging. We are the only ones who can be responsible. As I've told you before, you get a ship and you're steering it through life. Nobody else is gonna get up there and steer it for you. It's all your ship. You get to steer. And you're the only one that can steer what's in your mind, what you're going to carry with you. So you test for yourself. Go test it for yourself. Read, read number 19, <coughs> the Dwayta Vitaka Sutta, it's Dwayta Vitaka. And the Dwayta Vitaka Sutta, if you've ever been at one of our retreats, you always hear this one in the beginning. You usually hear 19 in the beginning and 21 at the end. Um, so the Dwayta yeah, Dwe Vitaka Sutta. And the thing about this is the way this sutta actually starts talking about um, what the Buddha is doing when he's teaching always sounded to me like my kids coming and saying, let's set up a science experiment. And in the Buddha is talking about, he says, um, because before my enlightenment, while I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, this is before he was a Buddha. Um, it occurred to me, suppose that I divide my thoughts into two classes and I set on one side the thoughts of sensual desire, ill will, and cruelty. 
And I said on the other side, the thoughts of renunciation, giving up those views is what this is applying to, thoughts of non-ill will, which is loving kindness, and thoughts of non-cruelty, which is the compassion. So he's saying, um, basically, uh, renunciation, renouncing revenge, anger, getting back at somebody. So we can say um, it's basically um, forgiving everything. Try it for a few days. See what you're. See what I'm talking about. See what you think of it. If you live your life and everything you go through, you forgive everything that you're confronted with from the time you get up un until you go to bed. And um, you forgive everything and apply the idea of loving kindness into the situation. And then, and compassion is where you see the person that you feel that person was always coming at you, you know, and you picture that from before in your mind. Don't do that. Just look at it as a new, new experience and choose to look at the person as if they are in pain and they're having trouble with their life. And, it's not, remember what I told you about if anybody's ever, ever yelling at you or something, that they're not yelling at you. They're yelling at themselves. If you know them personally at all, or they're in the same area that you work in or stuff, watch their behavior. And you'll notice that when they get upset or if they're yelling at somebody, they, they are actually yelling at themselves. Now, it, how does this come down like a supervisor and people working in one room? is that um, the supervisor is, um, you know, putting uh, the people down, but actually is he putting the people down or is he angry at himself for not training them better? <laughs> Which is it? Is he angry at himself because he didn't get them to understand the situation better? And so they're not doing what he wants them to do. You see, so make, choose to make a, a week, take a week and do this. And forgive everything that's happening. The hot water doesn't work. The toilet won't flush. <laughs> the water broke down. In India, where I am usually, uh, you know, it's all my whole life revolves around the water. You can ask people when I give talks, I have to take a break because the water is coming. <laughs> and I have to turn it on to let it in. And I have to turn it off to stop it from coming in. And there's this constant living with the living situation where I'm located, even when I'm trying to give talks on here. And for newcomers, if you're just coming the first time, if I ever talk too fast, always listen to it afterwards at 0 0.75, <laughs> 0 0.75 on the speed instead of, you know, uh, trying to suffer through trying to understand me if I'm talking too fast, okay? It comes out very well. There's another monk that comes out very well, and I'd like you to try this because I found a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful speaker who I couldn't follow. And he's speaking English, but very fast. And I want you to listen to Ajahn Brahmali. And if he's talking too fast for you, go back and listen again and put his talks at 0.75. It's the most wonderful stuff I have ever heard about his, his lessons. I listened to his dependent origination. I listened to the Eightfold Path. I listened to several of his talks. And I experimented with him because of my own situation. And he is a wonderful speaker. I want to write him a letter about this uh, because it's important that people hear him. He's wonderful and he's clear, but he's He's emotionally there with Dhamma, kind of like I'm emotionally there with Dhamma. And he goes on very simply, and sometimes people can't catch him. Anyway, um, in this one, in Dwayta Vitaka, it sounds just like he's setting up a science experiment. Of, he talks to the monks and he says, you know, I abided diligent, ardent, and resolute. And um, he talks about how it was for him to live over here uh, in the unwholesome side of things, not, uh, you picture him not abiding by the uh, the precepts and not uh, keeping the wholesome in his mind all the time. And he talks about how that's difficult for him. It's difficult for other people. It's difficult for both everybody and it doesn't work. And then he talks about uh, how he goes to the other side 
for the experiment with keeping the precepts with wholesome mind, keeping the uh, the uh, eightfold path and such. And you know he's trying to just live in the wholesome. And he talks about how that turns out. So now, now I'm going to point this out to you. You're not supposed to believe me, and you're not supposed to believe the Buddha. You're supposed to be experimenting on all of this and asking questions constantly. And you're supposed to be testing it because the Buddha was an activist and he changed the relationship between the teachers and the guru or teachers and the guru and or teacher and the students is what I'm trying to say. And he demanded of his monks that they practice in a way called knowledge and vision. And knowledge and vision is the, the, the foundation stone to move onward to knowledge and wisdom. So you don't just talk about knowledge and wisdom unless you understand how you're going to get there. And if we go back in the text, we find out that one of the accomplishments, one of the attainments in the middle of your development for your development of meditation and understanding the Dhamma, the, in the middle of that path is the attainment of knowledge and vision of how things actually work. I'll be darned. Wow. That's true. If that's true, that's something really important. He even told stories in the text about asking monks to leave if they wouldn't practice this way. Because he, he needed you to have direct knowledge to understand what he was teaching. So this is, this is all part of understanding that this path is not a set of commandments. And just like the precepts are not commandments, the precepts are advice. So if you want your car to go the right way, you got to put five fluids in it to make the car go and make it go to the most efficient way the car can drive. You have to put gas, you have to put oil, you have to put brake fluid, you have to put steering fluid, and you have to put transmission fluid. That's five liquids into that car, even the newest cars, okay? If you don't, you don't get the car's full ability that you thought you were buying. It doesn't work, okay? So the human being just consider us a model of car walking around <laughs> and we're given five precepts. If we keep the precepts, then we don't have trouble with the hindrances. But if we don't keep the precepts or we play with the precepts and say, oh, we just use them. Those are training, training precepts. No, 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 no. They were for life. And the brain works and learns by tapping this way the same way and practicing the same exact way every single time the brain eventually goes into automatic yeah and then automatic it starts running the cycles of twim automatically right effort starts occurring if you've been doing it that's what it's going to learn <laughs> if you have if you don't do the do this all the time don't expect it to change your life that much. You see? So retreats were only for the purpose of deep work. And as I've told you before, it, they didn't have retreats in ancient times. That wasn't happening. It was quite different. There were schools of meditation you went to and you stayed with them for periods of time. But they didn't have these kinds of retreats we have in modern times. These are not things to do four times a year. These are things to go in and do deep work to develop the length of your observation period with your mindfulness and then come out and start using something all the time to change your life and make life easier. So this is a support system. What we're examining is one of the major support systems he gave us. So in this one, the, sec this one, uh, the second one, let's see, the first one was uh, a harmonious perspective. And so that one was right view. The second one is right thought. And we call it imaging because that's what it is. It's keeping images in your mind and the images give you impressions of how to live, how to react, how to behave. The third one, okay, is um, called um, harmonious communication. And this one, was um mm -hmm, right <laughs> let's see this one was harmonious music pick them right 
I'm, I'm blank. I'm blank, blacking out here. It's wonderful. By the way, I need to tell you, I'm old. <laughs> I have people here listening to me. <laughs> Finding out I was old during COVID was really fun. Nobody ever told me I was old before. And this year I was 73. I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> Seven plus three is 10. So I still feel all right. 10 years old is not bad. Anyway, in harmonious communication to ourselves and to others um, via our thoughts, our words, and our deeds, how do we communicate with ourselves and how do we communicate with other people is really important. And this is thoughts, let's see, thoughts, words, and deeds. We should also say body language. We all know about this in modern times body language. So you go and you listen to a teacher and you fold your arms, you fold your arms in front of the teacher. Are you hearing anything the teacher says? Or are you arguing against him in your mind or the person against your mind? If you're sitting there with your arms folded and locked up, or if you sit there and cross your legs. So this crossing your legs and folding your arms in communication when you're listening in school Oh, in school, in school, in the lecture hall, if you're doing that, you're not hearing what the teacher says. They've done all kinds of research with this. How much can a person remember if they have an open body when they're listening, or if they have a shut down body with their own opinions locked inside, are they even hearing this? And when we open the person up and put them in the right sitting position without their legs crossed or their arms folded, they start retaining a lot more in school and their grades go up. This is something you don't have to believe me. You can just try it for yourself and see what happens. You know, at business meetings, at all kinds of uh, events where you are, uh, you know, applying this stuff and trying to see how it works. But this communication is not only to other people, it's to ourselves. Do we communicate with ourselves that much? Somebody might say no. But did you, before you went in, make an opinion of yourself and communicate an opinion that was going to come out of yourself in your behavior when you go in the room to talk to other people? Are you making predisposed determinations about what's going to happen in something before you go in there? So this is all about moving and living and walking and talking and everything in the present time and staying on track and working in the present time. I don't like to say the present moment. You'll learn that about me. The reason I don't like the present moment is because, well, a moment is a part of a second and a second is part of a minute, a minute is part of an hour. <laughs> and you, if I had a guy come in to an interview once and tell me he was exhausted from his meditation. I said, well, what did you do? He said, sister, I tried really hard to stay in the present moment. I had my watch on. Oh, I said, I told you to take the watch off. <laughs> yeah, but he said I had a second hand and I tried really hard to stay in the present moment. It's impossible, isn't it? Everything's going doo -doo 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 like that. Everything's moving all the time. So why would you do that? But understanding the principles of the Bhada Karata Sutta, it's in Majima Nikaya, must be important. Why am I saying that? The only sutta in the Majima Nikaya that is repeated four times, four times, very succinctly, is the Bhada Karata Sutta. And the lesson in the Bhada Karata Sutta, it's 131, 132, 133, and 134. And the, the message here is a really important message for you to start out with when you're practicing and you're learning about things. Because the message here is about staying in the present time. It's an old message. And I found out in Sri Lanka that from interviewing older monks, meaning in their 90s with translators and talking about things in the Dhamma, they talked to me and they told me when they were young, all of the monks knew this, this one little uh, poem that is in here, this uh, piece that's in the sutta. They all had to learn it and they all had to teach everyone in the villages about it. Let not a person revive the past 
or on the future hold his hopes for the past has been left behind and the future has not been reached. Instead, with insight, let him see each presently arisen state. So that's what you're supposed to be doing, understanding the phenomena arising, existing, and disappearing. Let him know that insight and be sure of it, invincibly and unshakably. How? By direct experience, by knowledge and vision, by seeing it working. Today, the effort must be made. Tomorrow, death may come. Who knows? No bargain with mortality can keep him and his hordes away. It just happens. You don't know when it will happen. But one who dwells ard thus ardently, relentlessly by day and by night, not sitting day and night, sitting in retreat to learn, but using this practice he's been teaching you of right effort all the time. And right striving is operating all the time because that's how people can change because that's how the brain learns by repetition, repetition, repetition of the same thing. And the cycle takes hold if you practice it all the time, roughly two months. Now I'm pretty sure over the years, I've been doing this over 21 years, roughly takes two months to grab a hold and become automatic when something you something causes you to start moving towards tension and tightness in your head. It simply sees that your brain knows this is how you're going to live your life. Let go, relax, smile, come back. And it all has a purpose, each part, which we've learned. And okay, that's what it is. And if you keep doing it rest relentlessly day and night, it is he, the peaceful sage, has said, who will have a single excellent night. You see? So let's keep going. Okay, that's the imaging and the communication. Uh, and the communication, we communicate, remember, with thoughts, with words, with deeds, meaning actions. And the actions are mental, verbal, or physical actions. That's what that's about. We must discover the value of encouraging uh, a more harmonious movement of mind's attention. Ah, ah, we have the power to retrain our mind from reactions to responses. We are not stuck. Nobody's stuck, remember. And we learn to change the habitual tendency we have uh, from anger management, from bursting into anger to forgiving and compassionate space and using loving kindness. If we just keep doing that, you see, we're talking neuroplasticity here. We're talking neuroplasticity. That word means, uh, neural means the brain and the brain's plasticity means the flexibility of the brain and how the brain can learn. And how it learns is important because before 12 years ago, we didn't think the brain could change like this. We thought that people could be stuck and we allowed them to think they could be stuck. You're not stuck. Congratulations. <laughs> okay. So now the next one here is um, we did communication. One thing about the movement of mind's attention, because we understand how this is all working, we understand we can retrain our mind. And the harmonious movement of mind's attention is will we let our attention drift into the past or will we let it drift into the future or will we stay right here between these two in the present time? And will we learn to do one thing at a time in an excellent way in the present time instead of getting caught in either direction? That's our practice in life, okay? Okay, the next one is harmonious lifestyle. And you know, harmonious lifestyle by taking things less personally and letting things go more easily, you're going to reduce the tension and stress in life and you're going to develop a more harmonious lifestyle where you get along with more people in difficult situations, in all situations in interaction. And you can, uh, you can examine when I say harmonious lifestyle um, or right livelihoods will come, the, this was right livelihood before, right livelihood is basically, they used to say, don't get involved in any industry 
that has to do with um, poisoning or um, killing in any way, killing or poisoning or war, like don't get involved in making uh, missile guidance systems. Don't commit yourself to doing that or these kind of things. <laughs> you know, don't contribute to that, that whole thing um, and choose a lifestyle. But what, what I'm gonna get more, more, uh, point, more pointed with this and say that what's really important is you develop a lifestyle of living, which includes livelihood. And you won't go into those things they don't want you to go in livelihood that they pointed out. If you're developing a, something that is space for your development of forgiveness, for compassion, for loving kindness, for um, the loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity, and you're working with pet, set yourself up a living. And I mean, this doesn't have to be a big place. It doesn't. I've uh, dealt with people that have very tiny houses and only maybe two rooms in the house or three. They have an outside bathroom. They have one tree in a tiny little walled in area. So around the tree, they put a bench. And if anybody's in the family sitting on the bench with a scarf over their head, no one bothers them. They know they're sitting for a period of time. No one's gonna bother them. And uh, if they have a tiny place inside the corner of one room where they can have a little altar and they want to do uh, their prayers or any sort of chanting. And the chanting that we believe is the most valuable is the chanting where you're repeating the lessons that we're teaching you here in those chants. In other words, the Anupana and the, the uh, two of them. Pan, Ana, Pan, Pan, Analoka and Panaloka are the rising of the links, the dependent origination and the passing away and repeating, repeating, repeating them until you know them by heart. That's the kind of thing. And the interesting thing about uh, keeping up with the simple um, puja ceremony, the basic puja ceremony, these are not rituals, okay? These are basic ceremonies you do for particular reasons to remember how the Buddha taught or the points in this Eightfold Path and things like that. And anything like that is what we put in the chanting book at Dhammasukha when we created it, because we wanted you to, if you wanted to do chanting, a lot of monks don't do chanting, okay? They're interested there for meditation or they come to be a monk so they can print all the things that are written and they're printing, printing people, you know, or uh, they are monks that have had um, occupations before and any place they want to develop new sites for temples or meditation centers, these monks go there and they are builders and they'll rip apart buildings and renovate them and tear them apart and build the inside. Bet you didn't know that. I didn't. I didn't know these monks would take their outer robes out and off and be bare chested down and have just their under robe skirt on and be out there as a carpenter and a plumber and tearing walls apart and everything else. And I, I met up with that in Florida at Kissimmee Temple, a Thai temple. And uh, this is a very strict tradition of the Thai. This is the uh, Damhut. It's a very, very strict and they all work together to tear down the chain link fence between the temple and the property next door they bought. And they gutted the three houses over there and turned them into houses for a meditation, people to come for meditation and things like that. So they're not beside themselves about doing hard work. You see, we have funny impressions today about what monks should be and what monks should not be and everything else and what we can, do, we should do and that sort of thing. You see, so we have to open up a little about this, you know, because right today, modern people are not going to take uh, months off to go build temples or attend monks or things like that is not happening on a regular basis in the modern development of Buddhism. It's not happening that much. So it's unusual when somebody makes a commitment for a few years to go attend a monk and stuff. So we don't take into consideration what we thought they were and what they actually are. Okay, so here, harmonious lifestyle. I explained that you basically want to have space. So you have time in your schedule to do meditation. And there's, you always have time. If you shift your 
mother, I have mothers and fathers who get up at four o'clock in the morning before the kids get up and they do their meditation for an hour in the morning. And then they start their day with the kids and the house and everything else. You see, it, it's out, up to you if you want to do this or not. Not everybody's going to be meditating as much, but if you manage to meditate one time a day for 30 minutes to an hour, you're in really good shape. And if you meditate before you go to work, you will see there's a change in your drive in traffic <laughs> and your uh, drive into uh, work and how you deal with people in work. You're going to find it's different. Okay, harmonious practice. This The six, seven, and eight, the three down here, six, seven, and eight are really important. They are the ones that hit home with tranquil wisdom insight meditation. Okay, harmonious practice used to be called right effort. We, we said what it is. It's a practice and it has four steps. There have been break off writings about this saying these are four separate practices. No, it's very obvious from the Pali scholars I've spoken with that this is one practice with four steps. And the first two steps of your right effort recognizing an unwholesome mind state, releasing that unwholesome mind state and relaxing your head. That part is the practice that is um, cleansing or purifying your mind. That's the purification of the mind, letting go of the unwholesome, bring, uh, letting go of the unwholesome and relaxing and uh, is what the steps are and why the relaxed step is happening. I will explain uh, to you uh, once again, I've said it before, but the apparently within the preservation work of the Pali in the text, the one place we have very clear, full set of instructions for meditation is Anapanasati, the Anapana, the breathing meditation. If we look at those instructions and we say, okay, he taught one meditation path and way to get to the cessation and come out and have the experience of Nibbana happen. He was dealing with, in our opinion, this is our opinion, you can research it yourself and figure out what you like to think about it. There were not 42 different kinds of meditation. There were 51 different objects that we found that he used, but only one set of instructions that were complete for meditation. So we pay attention, don't disregard those breathing instructions, the breathing instructions. And we look at the breathing the way many of the master teachers looked at it through time. Most of them are dead now, uh, dead or going fast, okay? Um, and they looked at it uh, in the light of, you need all 16 of, to consider all 16 pieces, 16 dyads, Dyads are like on the in-breath, this happens, on the out-breath, this happens. On the in-breath, this happens, on the out-breath, this happens. So that's two dyads, okay? So 16 dyads in the instruction, and what when we started to research it way back, this is in 2003, 2004, um, we're seeing that people were teaching 12 or 14. So what are the ones they were leaving out was on the in-breath, tranquilize the bodily formation, on the out-breath, tranquilize the bodily formation. And then the second one was in the next paragraph, on the in-breath, tranquilize the mental formation, on the out-breath, tranquilize the mental formation. So these two things we knew were really, really important. Now you take those two things and you remember Nama Rupa, and Nama Rupa is like, Rupa is the bodily, the material body, and rupa is the mental function within uh, that link having to do with human cognition in dependent origination. So if I relax my brain, if I relax my brain, my it affects my body physically. You can practice this and figure it out for yourself. You can test it. You write me a note, I'll send you back instructions to do a little exercise at home so you can prove it for yourself. That if you give instruction to your mind to lower your blood pressure, you can lower your blood pressure. Your blood pressure and your heart will go slower. You can um, change your breathing and you can slow your breathing down, slow your digestive system down, slow your uh, blood pressure down in, in relationship to your heart. This is all well known in the medical community. So 
mind-body connection is a real active thing. So leaving this out of any meditation, you're, you're sort of leaving part of the instructions, <laughs> you're leaving out a big part of the instruction. So if we relax our mind, we, we will feel a letting go. And if we're smiling, what is the smile about, Sister Kama? Well, if you go to Sutta number 89, and you go to section 12 of 89, you're gonna read about an account when um, we have this experience where there's an account of a bunch of monks in the area that are sitting in meditation or walking and talking or sitting and talking about Dhamma and they're all smiling. How'd that happen? Well, they're smiling. Oh, but monks don't smile. Oh, but they do and they did. <laughs> And they did because they had this wonderful release and they had this lightness and so they were smiling. And then we have in the Dhammapada uh, places, you have a whole section on happiness. And when you read it, you know, if you're doing those things, you're smiling. So this is, we are the happy ones. The section in the Dhammapada is leaning, teaching that principle of we are the happy ones. Why are we the happy ones? Because we're letting go letting go, relaxing, smiling, coming back, and a constant thing, a constant lesson for our, our brain of let go, relax, smile, come back. Whatever it is that you're confronting, whatever it is that's happening, just remember in a few minutes, it's going to change and it's going to disappear. And that's the effect of what? Anicca. That's the effect of Anicca, everything is impermanent. It is changing all the time. So why get stressed about anything that's happening in your meditation? Because whatever it is, if you will just accept one of the three characteristics is fact, all things that arise pass away. And then you say, okay, it's gonna pass away, leave it alone. So there are no instructions in the text that we can find, for instance, as an example, that one should take a breathing meditation and concentrate on the breath in any way. It's not in the instructions. It happened later that someone put this in the instructions. So it wasn't supposed to be that the breath was going to give you some kind of answer or any object for that matter. Let's look at objects. The object itself in a practice is important to understand. The question came up for me, well, what is the purpose? I remember going to Bonte about this and saying, well, tell me what is the purpose of having an object in a meditation in the first place? Now we should be able to figure that out. We should all, most of us are meditating. So if a hindrance comes up and you did move away to it, what would you do if you didn't have an object of meditation? You have to have an object. So the law, one, the law or principle of having an object in a meditation is to have a home base, a recentering point, place to come back to. So if you are pulled away, from just observing what is happening in front of you. If you are pulled away in the beginning of this practice from the spiritual friend, when you do realize you're pulled away, that's why you take right effort and you take the two steps, recognize I'm pulled away. I'm not with my spiritual friend. I let go, relax. Then I smile and come back. So the first two steps I said were purification. And the second two steps of you know, let go, relax, uh, let, recognize, and then let go and relax is the purification. Then bringing up a wholesome is the third step and carrying out the wholesome and trying to stay with what that feels like, that kind of thought, that kind of practice where you feel that level of steadiness. Keep that going. That's the wholesome. That's the wholesome. And that is retraining the mind retraining the mind so that as much you repeat this and pretty soon your brain says, oh, that's what you want me to do. <gasps> okay. <laughs> and then suddenly you're outside, something happens in life and you're, you normally would get real upset, but you don't, you don't get upset because your brain automatically says, oh, well, this is what's really happening. This is what is actually 
um, essentially going on. Don't think about anything else. Just see what's going on. Decide what how you're going to respond to it and then take action or whatever you're going to do with it. But don't react to it. And you just, your mind just knows what to do because you've been teaching it. And now they know that the brain learns a pattern of behavior for sure by the same tap, same way every time. See? So just never mind what comes up and get curious about what comes up in the sense that you will just observe whatever comes up and lovingly accept it as it is, no matter what it is. And understand it isn't going to be there. It's going to come up and you see it, experience it. Even uplifted joy. People want to hold on to it. How do I get it? How do I keep it all the time? No, 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 no. <laughs> you don't get to keep it all the time unless you learn exactly how it feels and supports itself. And then if you're doing everything right to support it, it'll be there longer, but it's always going to arise, be there, pass away. Bliss, bliss. I want the bliss. Oh, you want the bliss. You want to hold on to the bliss. You can't hold on to the bliss. It's like you came here to me because you want to get happiness. That's the big one we were talking about this morning. Uh, I want happiness. Yeah, but the, the problem with happiness is that happiness is not the product. What do you mean? Well, happiness happens to be a byproduct of the way that you choose to live. And that's how happiness occurs. So if you live well and you keep your precepts and you don't have hindrances bothering you and your kindness is what is out there, then that's what's going to come around to you. And that's going to support happiness happening more often. But you have to always remember that it isn't something that you can have as the product. It is a byproduct and affected by whatever's going on. So you can see it, it really bothers people if something big and awful happens, everyone's screaming and I'm standing there looking at it saying, ah, this is happening, okay? And this is the present time, okay? So what exactly precisely is happening? What can I do to help the situation? And I behave differently than other people do with that. And they wonder what's wrong with this person. They're not Go, going crazy. You, you don't need to go crazy. You need to find out in your as quickly as possible what is real, what is essential, what is unessential. It's unessential to get crazy. It's just useless and crazy and not be able to help the situation at all. What did you learn? What do you remember? What should you do? What? Where should you be? How can you help? All that's right there for you if you're steady in your understanding that whatever is happening is momentary and is happening and changing, happening, changing all the time. This is very interesting, this stuff. Okay, that's the harmonious lifestyle, harmonious practice. We're talking about right effort. The four steps of right effort are basically one, recognize the unwholesome mind state in your mind. Number two, let go of the, uh, release the unwholesome mind state and relax the head. The number three, bring up a wholesome mind state, which the fastest way to do that is to counter it with a smile. Smiling opens your frontal part of the two parts of your brain just slightly and touches the, loosens up where the pineal gland is located, allows the endorphins or dopamine to flow just a tiny bit and you feel uplifted and secure. That's what that is. And then you keep that going and keep producing more, um, more, types of mindsets like that, that feel the same, that are these supportive mindsets that are getting more and more balanced as you practice because you're understanding how precisely this works. So this one is the, is the one about the practice and the right effort, okay. Next one here was harmonious observation. We called it mindfulness before, right mindfulness. We wanna express it clearly. To let, you, to let you really understand that this is a harmonious form of observation in Buddhist meditation. We don't have to get real loose about this. What are you observing? You are observing the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, how you get, that means how you get involved with it emotionally or otherwise, the, the, um, the danger of it, 
which is that these things that come up in your mind can pull you away from the present time or from the observation you're doing in your meditation. So the origination of the phenomena, the disappearance of it, how it works, the gratification, the danger, and the best one, the escape, which was the practice we just looked at to immediately assert the cycle of the practice. So this harmonious observation, they called um, right mindfulness. Uh, we stress this observation point to you because it's not the, the sort of sterile, uh, what you call secular version of mindfulness. Uh, and we, we see very clearly that it was trying to, what is it trying to remember? It has this remind you of something or make you remember something. It re makes helps you to remember immediately from things that are going on in the practice that when something comes up, you should immediately be doing right effort. And so when right effort is picked up and it's going automatically, it becomes right striving. And the right striving and right effort are related to each other in the texts. It's the same paragraph for each one explaining what it is. It's identical. So why does that happen? Well, I finally gave in to the idea that right, um, you know, right effort is while you're learning to do it, and right striving is when it's happening automatically, because you also have in the 37 requisites of enlightenment, you also have a place where you have um, five faculties, and then you have five powers. And it's clear to everyone, most teachers will understand this and they do tell you right away that the reason it, those are in there twice, the same exact one, it's, um, let's see, if that broke. faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom are in there twice in two groups. Why? Well, you're learning it and learning to apply it here. And then when it's happening automatically, they are balanced. These are balancing by themselves. These these five pieces. Okay, like I have five fingers. They're they're going like this all the time when you're learning them, like in a computer thing going up and down. And all of a sudden they get very perfectly together. They become five powers. So I looked at that, and we looked in the text in several different directions. We figured out, you know, this is seems to be what's happening with right effort and right striving because wherever we go in the text we find the same two paragraphs that is explaining it. And there's no difference. Just sometimes the situations are slightly different, but it's, it seems like that's what it is. You have to think about that for yourself. Okay, so here um, we have the set, the seventh one is your harmonious observation. And you're always trying to sharpen your mindfulness. With, what does it mean to sharpen your mindfulness? to be able to sit longer for the purpose of seeing how things arise and exist and then pass away. And when you first hear the Anupada Sutta, Jimana Kaya number 111, which is Sariputta's experience, and that's a description of the tranquil wisdom insight meditation path, what, he, what happened for him, is what we can learn to follow. And when we pulse, it is totally possible to see things happening one by one as they occurred. If you are very still and you understand none of the hindrances that come up are important at all. So you're just letting them go. You're increasing your time and interest and energy and mindfulness is all being applied to simply watching to see what happens next. And that's that should be your mindset, the mindset of a two-year-old peeking around the corner, you know, around the corner uh, like this, you know, I'm just peeking around the corner to see what's in the room, what's in the room, what's next, <laughs> what's in there. And these little kids are giving you a hint. That's what you're supposed to be looking at and seeing what will happen next when it comes up as you're investigating. Okay, then we go to the next piece. And the eighth one, that's your observation. And the next one, um, I can find the X on these things, okay. The, um, the harmonious collectedness is really important. This is the eighth part. Now, this was um, 
rate concentration. Now, rate concentration is a fun thing because, let me see, I'm looking, but I didn't bring it. Okay, in the Vasudhi Manga, in chapter three, in the very first page, the very first page, okay, uh, when it's talking about concentration and it's identifying what is meant by concentration throughout the whole section, which is most of the rest of the book, uh, pertaining to meditation and concentration. Um, it's real interesting <laughs> uh, because it says that you should develop a profitable level of concentration, profitable level. So what is a profitable level of concentration? Now, there are other places in the text that have told us you need a level of concentration so that you can reach the path uh, and then be able to go down the path easily through the rupa jhanas and the arupa jhanas. And so we're looking at, that's a great deal of harmony that you're asking for this to be very harmonious, very, very um, profitable if it's, if it's at a harmonious level. And then we give you the story of Soma, the monk who decided he was living, he was living with a group of monks and um, they had to call the Buddha to come and talk to Soma because Venerable Soma was practicing too hard. He was practicing way too hard. He had tried to commit himself to keep practicing till he got to Nibbana. But he had his feet were all bloodied because he wasn't being careful walking at night when he had to go out and walk the line between two candles on the path. He was hurting his feet. His cootie was falling apart. He wasn't paying attention to his living the way he was supposed to be living with other monks. And he was really in serious trouble and not getting enough sleep. He was going through sleep deprivation. There's no, no reason for sleep deprivation. Um, and uh, he was sitting way, 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 way too long, forcing himself to do this. And he was feeling terrible and not easy to get along with. And they called the Buddha in and the Buddha sat down with Soma. And the first question he asked Soma was, Soma, what did you do before you were a monk? What was your profession? Of course he knew because, you know, we could read everybody's minds, but he asked Soma to tell him. And Soma said, I, I was a lute player. You were a lute player. Soma, how do you tune a lute? I always wondered, how do you tune a lute? And Soma started to explain that when you tune a lute, you run the wire on the lute, the string, and then when you tighten it, you must be very careful because if you tighten it too tight, the tones of the lute will squeak and squeak and squeak. And if you have it too loose, the tones of the loose will, the, the lute will growl like, like that and they won't come clear it's just like a guitar you know tuning the guitar with too loose or too tight and you have to have it just right and he said soma your concentration is the same way he said you have to take your concentration you must practice your concentration carefully you must make sure your concentration is balanced in tune like a lute and then soma got the idea He's from this discussion with the Buddha about some other things. He began to eat right, to exercise right, to sleep correctly, to be fresh, which, by the way, is what the Buddha did in the end to be able to go through under the tree. If you read the whole story and read everything, get all the information, you begin to understand he had to stop depraving himself, stop fasting, stop deprivation of sleep, stop all these things types of torture that he was trying with the other five ascetics. And he, he finally figured out something remarkable. He figured out everyone was practicing with outer types of objects of meditation where this was the subject here and the object was there. And the Buddha did something remarkable. He figured out the only way out of the suffering was to go in. And what does it mean? The only way out is in. It means he, that the subject, you, become the object. 
Why did it happen? Because he understood, he began to understand enough about mind as the forerunner of all states, mind made are they. And everything in our body is operated from a control center in here somewhere. And they're all watching out the eyes, everything that's going on. All these little people are inside the control center and you have to understand that control center and reconnect the communication system in your body and mind connection. And what we're learning when we're practicing the way we're teaching is we're teaching you, you're teaching you how to train your own mind to respond to your intentions. When you lean, how to work that way. When you lean this way, how to go that way. This is a remarkable thing he did, totally against everything that was going on in meditation at the time. And part of the discovery was he didn't have to use a heavy meditation. He didn't have to fight with any hindrances. And he had many. And later he explains to the monks all the hindrances in the Majjhima Nikaya. There are at least nine or 11 suttas pointing to him, explaining to them, I tried this, it didn't work. I tried this, it didn't work. Don't do this, it didn't work. Don't do this, it didn't work. And then I remembered something and it brought back a memory Maybe I don't have to work so hard. Uh, maybe I can remember a Nietzsche that when they arise, they'll pass away. And maybe I should just leave them alone. Later on, he understands that the nutriment for the hindrances themselves was his personal attention on them. And he starts to point out to the monks, no obstacle can ever become a hindrance. It can never become an obstruction, a distraction, big deal, unless I engage it, he told them. And if you remember that statement alone that is in Sutta number 22 in section 10, if you know that one thing, no obstacle can become an obstruction in your mind unless you pay personal attention to it. That's a big order. Do not engage the hindrance. Do not engage. This is what he told them. Just abandon them. Abandon them. And he is teaching them. Then they become destroyed, annihilated, eradicated, suffocated, suppressed, subdued, and all the rest of the things people tell you. You don't have to do that to them. Relax. Smile. Let them go. They're going to disappear anyway if you don't pay attention to them because they won't have any food anymore. So you're going to wreck the supply route for them to come and bother you. They're going to stop bothering you. But people are still out here 2,500 years later struggling like crazy with them, thinking they have to make them stop. But there is a problem with that, isn't there? Because we're trying to teach you to shift from Atta perspective to Anatta perspective. Not take things personally, but take everything impersonally. So that would be contrary to that, wouldn't it? And so abandon it, try it. You'll like it. It's amazing. As soon as you stop feeding them, they have nowhere to go and they will fade away and they will pass away. So this is your eightfold path. So I'm not watching a clock or I should be. Okay, so may you tell me how much I'm into this and we can stop now and throw it out to the floor and just see how, how are you guys working with this in life? Are you understanding these pieces? Okay, let me stop this. And come back. So now, how, how is it going for you? Are you looking at these pieces? And I would stitch them onto a list and embroider them into a little, you know, scarf and hang them at the door and look at them before I go to work or have them on a piece of paper on the wall at work, uh, something tacked up and say, am I paying attention to this? You see, how is it going for you? <laughs> Wow. 
where are you going with these eightfold path? Are you using them? How are you doing, T? Are you using them? Yes, yes, good. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> yeah, and you can see how they work. Yeah, that's good. I'm glad. Sarah, how are you doing? Oh, you, hi. Okay, how is it going? Oops, you're on mute. Oh, now I see. Okay, now you're on. Sorry, we had, we had two systems going there. That's got, we got feedback going. Um, well, <laughs> up, up, the the eightfold path is a is a wonderful teaching. Uh, always the, the challenge is uh, taking things personally and um, tuning in to seeing that link um, and staying staying sensitive to the tension because the difficulty often is that once you take things personally, um, tension is ruling what you're doing and uh, it's 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 expressing itself through uh, speech through actions and and the thoughts in the mind um, and the the temptation certainly for 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 people if you like brought up in the west and i'm sure it's true everywhere else um, is to try and think yourself out of that situation and yeah. teaching here is to feel yourself out of the situation not think mm -hmm. and we spend so or we're we're taught so much that thinking or to value thinking um, to, you know, to find a solution, to uh, resolve something. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas actually we've just got to come away from that. And uh, our initial response needs to be a feeling response. It needs to be a, a sensitivity to this tension, um, to see that the tension is getting in the way of any, um, constructive resolution um, right. uh, because the tension is often um, linked to the, the need to win um, even in the even in a minor way uh, to be proved right or um, uh, to have your perspective or view uh, seen understood validated or whatever um, and tension drives that uh, and the thinking brain drives that because if you're not resolving it the way you want it to do, you, you try and then rethink it and re-express it or uh, say it louder or, or whatever else. Um, and it's a, it's a feeling practice. It, it, uh, and, I, and I think that's, if that could be taught from an early age um, to understand that, Resolution <laughs> comes from releasing the tension. Yeah. Not imposing your tension onto the situation. Uh, we, we, we'd be in a very different position. I think you're right. I think you're right. I think one of the places that gets stuck with this teaching of, of in the last couple of years really struck me is that um, we we are um, put in a position of saying, and this is Buddhism, this is Buddhism. But um, I think the Dalai Lama spoke about this once and he basically said, you know, everybody should spend some time understanding the teaching of the Buddha. And someone said, why? Because no matter what religion you are, it makes no difference. No. Because this will make you a better whatever you are. This is an accidental religion. It's well, big, it's, it's, isn't it? it's a teaching of the human condition. Yeah, it's the human condition. And it certainly is a teaching of... Um, human cognition and the human condition and how it all works. Yeah. And what we see are the beautiful changes in people that are happening, the beautiful behavioral changes that are happening and um, you know, improvements for them in life um, by simply practicing this way, this doorway, the Brahma Viharas gives you. 
And um, the Brahma Vihara is, has this uh, functional fix that's automatically happening. So when you're practicing loving kindness, there's no thoughts of ill will in your mind. And when you're working on compassion, there's no thoughts of cruelty. And when it's impossible, if you're really working in the direction of compassion for cruelty to come up. And this whole thing is like an automatic bonus. And the joy is canceling out discontent. And the equanimity is finally wiping clean the aversion to anything because you're training yourself to see things as they actually are in their basic sense in the present time uh, without any additional stuff. So it's, it's bound to improve the human condition. I agree with you 100%. Yeah. Hmm? But, it's, but it's a... Uh, it's a, it's a, um, it's a universal currency, um, and it's. But the 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 the, the challenge is the, and I think uh, uh, what you said. Uh, if I can just, uh, it's the origin, disappearance, gratification, danger, and escape, and and this is what's missing from the secular mindfulness. Yes. Yeah. The secular mindfulness is much more about placating a situation or yeah. a circumstance. Um, and yeah. ultimately, that's not going to be helpful. It can be helpful well, in the short term. Um, uh, but if we're always seeking to placate rather than understand, uh, if we're not if we're not going to see the underlying structure behind um, the the process, um, it can become a, a practice of appeasement. Yep. And, that, and that's just not what the Buddha is is teaching. No, he wasn't. He was actually teaching uh, an actual change. It's like one thing Bhante used to say all the time is don't come to this, don't come to this practice, don't come to the real Buddhism at all, unless you really mean, intend to change. Don't do it. Because it was designed to change the person. And many people, um, you know, we, we live in this time of patchwork. I always say this, you know, if you look at, oh my goodness, <laughs> you know, we're, we're not going to go into politics. <laughs> But, you know, if you look at the world situation, we tend to see the struggle of every country in the world. We have to patch, 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 patch. But no one wants to look at how uh, things actually work. Uh, I always have the statement that gets young people upset. Sometimes I say, when they doing this peace conference, encourage them to open up with at least one or two days understanding how war happens and just talking about war. Because they don't understand how war works. Well, then how can they ever have peace? And that's like, if you don't understand how a bike works, please don't go on a hundred mile bike ride. You have to understand everything that's working on that bike before you do that. You know, you're a fool if you don't, you know, really long bike, biking. The same thing with almost anything, you know, you don't get a sailboat unless you really know how to, to uh, use that sailboat and take it out in the ocean instead of the bay, or try to go to the other continent with no knowledge about how everything works before you leave. You can't do this. And we seem to be struggling very hard and so wrapped up in our greed and our competition and our um, the greed and uh, aversion and hatred and competition and everything, constant, 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 that we forget we need to know the basics of everything first. The other, the other thing that I think is important, I mean, bringing mindfulness um, or secular mindfulness into business is, is something that's become extremely popular in certain areas. But what's, what I feel is misunderstood uh, is that mindfulness is a process of transformation. It is a process of change. And so, yeah. An organization needs to um, understand that if they're going to bring mindfulness in, they need to uh, embrace the change that it will promote. And if they don't embrace the change that it will promote, or if it's taught in a particular way, you're simply going to be teaching appeasement. 
uh, yeah. the way that people can put up with what's actually going on rather than transform what is actually going on. That's and right. the transformation is the most valuable part. And yet you see it <clears throat> time and time described in the, when people describe the benefits of it, it's, it's how people can manage stress more easily. Mm -hmm. well, managing stress more easily is um, an interim place. Um, it will simply mean that you're, you're, you've taken away the impetus to look at the sources of stress, which, which rob you of productivity, creativity, innovation, and all the rest of it. Um, if, you don't look, if, you, if you just introduce something that's going to make that more manageable for individuals, but, and, and that's all you're doing. You, you, this this is like a band aid. Doesn't change anything. It doesn't going, doesn't change anything. Yeah. It's not going to change anything. Well, this was this was one of the things. Yeah, yeah, this was one of the things I saw about the uh, you know about the breathing meditation and the breathing meditation. I met several people who have been for many many years breathing meditators in Malaysia, and um, you know it doesn't it. it we, he finally, you know, this one man really finally fessed up to me, the, you know, the truth on this. It never changed his relationship with his wife or his children or his marriage or the difficulties he was having at work. It was a stopgap. In other words, I go four times a year, he said, once every quarter to a meditation retreat and thereby I stabilize myself and my life. But those things are going, the retreats were never meant to go to, you see, <clears throat> to be stop gaps. The retreats were a uh, place to have a closed in uh, quiet area so that you could deep, do deeper work to develop the, the actual practice so that you could take that back and use it all the time in life. But you don't, you don't, for, like I used to give this example, it's kind of silly, but I actually have seen it happen, you know, where the person is a, is a breathing meditator, a very good breathing meditator, and they go into a new situation in a company and the supervisor doesn't get along and the supervisor is yelling at the person in the office and, and you know, or tells them to come in the office and they're ripping them up, you know, they're ripping them apart and yelling at the person and the person stands, this is just a moment, uh, let me ask you if you ever saw this happen, but the person tries to say just a moment. I'm a breathing meditator. Please pause. Okay. Okay, now you can proceed to yell at me. Go ahead. Have you seen a situation in an office where somebody could do this? Come on, tell me the truth. Have you seen anybody get through a situation like that where that's what they use it for? Come on, tell me. I'm just asking you, basically speaking and living life, has any, do you know anybody who solves it that way? Says this to a policeman or says it to somebody and says, just a minute, I'm a breathing meditator. Budo, budo, budo. Okay, now you can continue yelling at me. Budo, budo. Yes, it doesn't. No, 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 no. But the person, if they can just remember that when the person is screaming at them, they are screaming at themselves they have a piece of information it's a piece of knowledge you can you can test it for yourself with people it's really true and and so they're either uh yelling at themselves most of the time why didn't i train this person better why didn't they succeed in their in their position in their job description it's my fault you know and he's probably yelling at himself not you do you ever think of it that way or did you ever look at the person with total, complete compassion who you really don't know in life and say to yourself, maybe if this is Monday morning, maybe on Saturday night, his cat died. <laughs> maybe he's really upset and he just needs to take it out on somebody because somebody hit his cat or his dog. You, you don't know who, who these people are. You think you do, but you don't know. So I'm saying bring it, bring it down into life situations you see yeah I, I i agree i agree with that and that's a, a very useful uh way of re-establishing balance in in the present moment but also what i've found in organizations is that um if you introduce mindfulness then you 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 bring a level of awareness to people or, or yes. you're inviting them to bring a level of awareness where they'll see what are if you like structural inconsistencies for a more balanced way of working. And they'll, 
and they'll go through a process of inviting, you know, and suggesting change. Um, but if that change doesn't come through because the organization actually hasn't committed to change, it just wants That's the people right. to change, then, then they will leave. Because the mindfulness yeah. has given them the awareness to see that, you know, this is what I'm responsible for and I can change. This is what the yeah. organization's responsible for, which I can't change. Mm -hmm. And if the imbalance is such that, you know, then the mindfulness gives them the awareness to say, this is, this is not what I need to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's true. <laughs> Everything you're saying is that is really good. It's true. Yeah. So anybody else got questions on this? Or how to use these pieces? <clears throat> I've got a, uh, yeah. I've got a right. question. Uh, sure. Bante used to say that the, the, the whole eightfold path is, is held within the smile. Do you ah, yeah, that? you want that? You, you yeah. want that? Yeah, do you okay. mind just un unpacking no, that? No, I do. I can, I can pull it up for you if you want it. It's, I have it. Wait a second. Let me do this. Just a second. I have to go get it. Um, mm -hmm. I was going to put that in here. I was going to add it and I didn't. Um, Let's see. Let's see. Foundation. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see if we look at this one. And I put this down here. And I think I can. Well, I'll put that one down there too. Go here. Okay. Now let me go and share. Um, this is something that we put up. This is the. This is what we wrote a long time ago. Um, the Eightfold Path and a Smile. This is called the Eightfold Path. When we have a clear understanding of the interwoven nature of this noble Eightfold Path, then we can fulfill the entire path in one smile. Okay. So right view is practiced as harmonious perspective and living through a more impersonal perspective is a major key to living a happy life. You lighten up, and don't take things personally, you let go more often and you keep smiling. So this is the smile. Right thought is practiced through harmonious imaging, meaning bringing up an image of smiling and laughing, which lightens the mind and sharpens awareness for a clearer mindfulness, a, a sharper awareness of watching and not taking things personally, supporting wholesome thoughts, okay? And then, Oh, let's see. Mm -hmm. Right speech is practiced by harmonious communication, smiling lightly, laughing, and just you're laughing internally at, at how you're taking things too serious is what this means, which some people don't seem to understand. We're not saying just walk around laughing at life, but when you're smiling, you're keeping your practice light for success. And this is a communication with yourself that is so important, especially communication with mind, your speech and body language. It's really important. So right action is practiced by harmonious movement, which has to do with mindful observation in the example of remembering to notice the impersonal movements of mind's attention, how, how it does things without you telling it to, okay? And then applying right effort, the six arts, to direct mind away from unwholesome mind states into wholesome mind states and keeping your smiling with a light mind going as much as possible, keeping your inner smile alive as well. Because if you're not taking things so personally, you start keeping something in your mind. You keep a lighter view of life and impersonal observation to see what essentially is really going on in life. Right livelihood is practiced as harmonious lifestyle, which has to do with developing a new habit of smiling and gently laughing during your daily life. And this, this is like you're in a traffic jam and just everybody's beeping their horn and you used to get really angry and you start laughing at yourself for being upset with these thousands of cars around you on the LA freeway. And you just, you start, you start just thinking this is all really silly. Why am I upset? Look at these people. You start looking at how, why would anybody in, in okay, in India, there was a 15 mile truck backup, 15 kilometers long 
because of a bridge that had to be opened one lane at a time while they're building the new bridge. <laughs> and people would actually beep their horns. And I'm trying to figure out why would anybody beep their horn in a 15 kilometer long, you know, pile up thing? <laughs> why would anybody expect anybody to be able to do anything about it? But the guy is sitting there going beep, 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 you know? This is about letting things go more easily. All of this is about it all. Each one of these is sort of about an impersonal approach instead of a personal approach and getting your gander up about everything. Developing patience and compassion for others. Also setting up a lifestyle to support yourself. That's like that, you know, and then right effort is the four steps of right effort. We don't need to go through these, but it's, it's telling you seeing mind, well, seeing mind caught by an unwholesome thought or feeling, letting go of the unwholesome thought, feeling, relaxing, smiling, and uh, laughing at being caught. Laughing at yourself is what this is. It's not laughing at the world. It's laughing at yourself that you can't, it, it, that you have to retrain yourself to be, take something impersonally for a day. It's not easy because you're used to taking stuff and reacting to redirecting this lighter mind back to wholesome objects uh, like meta by smiling and keeping that meta smile and uh, going and keeping an impersonal perspective going. And right mindfulness is practice as harmonious observation, noticing the nature of mind's attention when it's light and smiling versus when there's tension arising in the mind and getting heavier and serious and pulled down. Noticing when you are caught by this and remembering what to do. And then the concentration I already explained to you uh, per, uh, is a precise level of light concentration, collected or unified mind that keeps the practice running smoothly. And mind is alert, calm, and composed. It's able to stay with the moment or the task in life. And I'd like to change these, get rid of moments and just say present time things without distractions or heaviness arising to pull it away. So you're smiling and laughing more easily in life. This is not saying smiling and laughing more easily at life. It is saying smiling and laughing at yourself for getting so uptight and letting go, letting go. Now, I will tell you one quick story. I had a um, Sri Lankan class of 12 women and um, they give them the assignment of going out home and using the Eightfold Path. And they came back for the Saturday class and sat down and many of them said, you know, I just didn't have time to practice. Another one would say, well, I managed to pay attention to it a couple of times. And another one would say, well, I managed to use these two parts once and then another time. And I'm listening to each one of them. And the, the last woman, uh, when it was her turn, she, she's sitting there shaking her head. She says, I, I don't know. I don't know. I was working so hard last week. I'm a customer service representative for a uh, like department store. I'm the one that takes all the return items and has to deal with people all day long like that. You see, and she says it's a really so I said, oh, customer service. And then I was I was playing with her. I said, did you smile? She said, oh, I have to smile all the time. And so I took her through each part of the Eightfold Path and I asked her when you were smiling, was this what you were doing? Well, yeah, I had to I, uh, you know, I had to have the right perspective. I had to keep an impersonal perspective because I really don't like doing this, but I'm doing it all day long. And then I said, what were you carrying good images in your mind? I had to keep good images in my mind of these people, even if they were right in my face, you know, and she told me each, each thing, each of the eight pieces. And then, um, then I said, was your communication good with these people? Said, oh, my communication had to be kind because I wanted them to come back to this store again. See, she had an answer for each one. And I had to be smart. She showed me the whole entire path. And I said, congratulations, you're the one that wins the prize for today. You did it all day long, every day last week. And she went, oh. I practice the Eightfold Path. <laughs> you know, she even has a place at home when she goes home, everybody has to leave her alone if she's all, you know, uptight. But she said, I try really hard to hang my coat at the door. And when I hang my coat and put my bag down, I pretend that I'm putting the job down and everything that happened that day is in the bag. 
<laughs> and she said, I just keep smiling. And then I have a great time with my husband and my kids. You see what she did? She lived that whole eightfold path in her job. You see what happened? So this is what he means. And, and she didn't think she had a job that we should would give her any time at all to practice the eightfold path. But the kids, I met her kids later and they just love her and she has a great sense of humor. And she didn't realize she had such a sense of humor until she went through my class. <laughs> and then she got going. She began to understand, I'm applying this stuff, you see. And um, it was really good. It was very good. That's what you mean, right? Yeah. Using it and, <laughs> and, and living it and laughing at anybody who isn't living it to yourself. <laughs> You know, because you have this power where you can just change this whole thing, you know. I like when I was driving by the truck in Ingl India in our car, I looked over and the driver was exasperated. I said, don't be upset. At least you're not under that truck having a baby. They were under the truck living there for like two or three days. These people and the woman had her baby under the truck. You know, <laughs> I said, we're in a car. We have air conditioning. Come on, everybody smile. <laughs> no matter how backed up we are. <laughs> And you, you have to have a sense of humor to even attempt to live in India beyond a four-day visit on a tourist thing or something. I've been there five years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know how, <laughs> you know, but I've been there five years. Yeah. So anything else, Perry? Uh, there was another one around. Uh, I've, I think I've seen you write it in the forums around when you're at work, you smile into the task as opposed to um, having meta as the object of meditation. Is that correct? Oh, sure. Yeah, we're practicing metta in your practice to learn how the metta feels, how it works, how you can move it. And the metta has a frequency. So we're teaching you how to shine. And then this shines out of you at a frequency. There's some books written about that. And um, so when you go to work, one woman said, well, how can I put meta into um, working on the computer to get this, um, the RFP ready to present to the people for the, the company I'm working with, they need to get the contract out. How, how can I be happy that I have to be here almost 11 more hours to do this? And I said, well, it's up to you. I mean, you can hate every minute of it if you want to, or you can just keep light and keep doing this and take your breaks. And she knows how to do power sits. I said, you know how to do power sits. Go hide in the closet for 10 or 12 minutes and you've got two hours of sleep and then come back and do it again. She's learned how to do her power sits. And you determine what your mindset is going to be. If you hate doing something, you're gonna make more mistakes on the computer. You're gonna have a lot more time to check everything, spelling, grammar, everything. Yeah, Mae's shaking her head over there. <laughs> she knows, I know too. You know, if you decide I have to get this done and you go in, you just say, this is, this is the task. And we're not gonna say it's like it was there. And we're not gonna say it could be like this here. We're gonna say we're in the task and let's use all the knowledge we have about being here now and only here now. Now, if you're a sports person, Perry, if you're into sports, you know, shit, 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 uh, shit, and flow, you know, about flow in the gym. I know about you, flow, yeah. Yeah, you get into flow. Well, that's what I'm teaching you. I'm teaching you to get in flow with loving kindness and, 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 and to use compassion and loving kindness and start smiling and laughing at the fact that you have a ways to go. You see? Yeah. So it, you determine how much pain it's going to be to spend the next 11 hours getting that, uh, that, um, presentation ready for the company only you can determine if that's going to make think it's going to, it's workable or it's not workable you know and you manage your own ship this idea that you know i don't like this idea you go to the psychologist it's not your fault perry it's your mother's fault it's your father's fault. It's not your fault at all. And there's too much of this going on, you know? You know, it's like, I'll get up. They may as well say this. You're giving them $200 an hour. You may as well say, oh, I would say now if I went to one, you know, okay, then are you going to come tomorrow? What do you mean am I going to come tomorrow? The doctor would say, well, are you going to come and get on my ship and steer it? 
because that's what you're asking them to do. And I had uh, one time I was in a retreat and for three nights in a row, a woman asked me, but Sister Kema, when are you going to tell us exactly like in this box, in this box, this, this little container, when are you going to tell us how to let go of all the suffering? Well, she's been listening to the, the, uh, to the suttas every night and listening to the Dhamma talk, right? And I'm explaining it to her, but every night the same question, but when are you going to tell us this? And I finally, I saw, you know, this and I said, are you, I'm so sorry. I said, you have to come every night and you have to practice every day. And when you leave, you have to keep practicing every day. And there's, I tried, but nobody, no boutique, no department store, nobody would carry what I'm selling. <laughs> this is no place you can go to buy this. There's no place that you can go and say, okay, here it is. It's in this little box. The answer to everything, immediate gratification permanently. And this is the happiness right here, 1995. It doesn't work that way. Happiness is a byproduct of the way you decide to live. If you decide to try to drive your ship without the living the precepts, there's only five for heaven's sakes, there's only five. And if you can't keep five, well then don't talk to me when the hindrances will not go away because you're gonna be one of those men sitting in Starbucks with your leg bouncing, your knee bouncing with nervous leg syndrome because you broke a precept, you didn't say you were sorry, you didn't take your precept again privately someplace. You don't need me to take your precept. You don't need the monk, you don't need the Dalai Lama, anybody. The precepts belong to you. You get to take them in the morning and before you go to bed at night. You drum them into your head. It's your ship, you're steering it. Nobody else is steering it. And right now there's a lot of different things in the world that are falling apart because people are frustrated because they can't have immediate gratification like they're going to a mall and it's definitely there and you can buy it. You see, they don't want to work. One time I spent three months designing a program to teach people how to teach TWIM over about two 14 week programs. I designed it with two professors, 40 so, uh, social workers came to that meeting uh, for to find out how the course was going to work. It was like a 101 and a 102 course type thing. It was all planned. I still have everything from that to teach and be teachers. As soon as we went over what it involved, only maybe one or two wanted to keep practicing. Everybody else left. Why? Because they came and they wanted a program where they could come for four days and get a certificate saying they could teach TWIM. It took me nine years to get to what I know now, but actually more than that. I mean, but at nine, at nine years, I started teaching individually and doing all of the tours with Bonte from 2000 all the way until all his overseas tours up until 2020. And, you know, in 2014, I was sent into Asia to try to locate and figure out a way to have a headquarters. Well, it didn't work to choose certain countries, and I ended up in India. And it has its own set of difficulties. And it's difficult anyway for me. It's, it's, it's going to be OK in India because there's five teachers now. And there's a bunch of people jumping on board. And I think it will be all right. But for me, the biggest thing was I didn't speak Hindi or Marathi. I could only say Zaudia. <laughs> Zaudia means let go. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> And I would get up there and say, you don't understand it. It's really simple. If it's bothering you, irritating you, and you're getting hot, you know, all you go is, oh, yeah, she said, Zaudia. Zaudia means never mind it, let go. Relax, smile, come back, and keep going. And the woman who said, how do you put loving kindness into typing? You look at the typewriter, and you love it. <laughs> And you keep going, what can I say? You keep going. You have to just keep going. So yeah. But and you're, the, you're um, right. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And, and you mentioned the power, power sit. Is that, could you just uh, speak briefly about, about the power sit? The which one? You said the um, one of your <laughs> students knew how to do a power power sit. It sounded like a short- Oh, tip. power sits, power sits, yeah. If you come to a retreat, I'll teach you how to do power sits. It's oh, not okay. hard. 
I've but, done okay. I've done a few. So okay, so like power yeah. sits. Okay, power sits started. I te started teaching doctors to do power sits, and it worked. And I started teaching nurses. And so I, and actually before that, I was teaching like a judge and a lawyer and uh, people that are in upper level CEO type things. It's like, um, find yourself a closet. Like I would tell a nurse sometime, you know where the utility closet is, just sneak into this utility closet instead of going into the break room and just find a bucket and turn it upside down, sit on the bucket. You can take a pillow in with you, sit on the bucket and you just let everything from the past go out of your head it's not allowed to be there if it's past means from this morning forward to this moment and past everything past thoughts let them go future of what happens when you go out that door forget everything let it completely go you sit you drop into whatever level you're in you know if you're you can do directions but it's not you don't need to do directions if you're doing them for a while you probably drop right into like your quiet mind spot and just sit there okay and watch nothing, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> and watch this dark pool, uh, like a lake, just, just sitting there, you know? And just look at, if you wanna concentrate on anything, what you would describe to somebody, nothing is. And you may not compare it to anything else in life, you just watch it. If you watch, if you've ever been to a lake or fishing or boating, at around five o'clock up till a certain mark, you know, as dusk is coming, the fish are jumping, you know, they're jumping in, they're feeding on uh, flies and stuff around the water. And then all of a sudden everything stops. And then the wind stops in the evening on lakes. And then it gets like glass. And then the dark comes in and you're sitting on the dock or sitting just watching this lake. And it's just absolutely still. So all you're watching for are tiny little wiggles in there and you're just, letting go of absolutely everything in your body. You're not scanning, that's too busy. But you're just saying to yourself, I will sit for 10 minutes and I will sit on emptiness and just uh, on nothingness. Or you say, you can, if you like uh, an in, in infinite space and you've done it a few times, if you've done determinations, if anybody showed you the basic determinations, you can say, I'm gonna sit for 10 minutes in, in um, infinite space. I happen to really like infinite space because it feels like you're not there. And I'm now I'm used to, it doesn't shake me up at all. I just, everything goes away and you think everything, everything is completely moving away from me, away from me, away from me. And you empty out and you keep smiling at infinite space and you think, wow, how nice. Yeah. And you just let all your energy come in here and settle you know, in, in your heart area and your head area, and you're just, just sitting there watching. This is all there is to this. And it's, it's, it's 10 minutes away from all of it. And you have to have already taken in there. A sound is just a sound. You see, so let all sounds go. Uh, a feeling is just a feeling. Uh, a sight is just a sight. A sn odor is just an odor. Taste is just a taste. Nothing. So you just leave everything. And how would that be? See, the whole teaching of the Buddha is a form, an exercise in cessation. So the whole entire path where Bhante would say is levels of understanding, that's true. But Delson went one step further. He caught real essence of this is each one of those levels that you go through is um, he caught uh, the fact that it's a level of cessation as you're moving towards cessation, isn't it? Yeah. So in the beginning of your practice, if you think of the whole exercise, uh, I tried to boil it down once for people. And I said, when you're sitting in that closet, try to experience an experience of no experience. You see? See? And you've mastered already, if you're practicing TWIM, you've mastered already that when you start with a spiritual friend as a center point, and then, you know, you move to other people, when you did the other people and practiced that, you were merely quizzing your brain to see if it would do the same thing with re repetitious people as it did with the first person, the first one. That's all you're doing. You're just trying to see, am I communicating yet with the brain? And actually, when you come out the other side of that, when you're finished, 
and then you start the directions, you are an advanced meditator at that point. You've gone farther at that point after the other people and you move into starting to work with the directions than most people have gone in 15 or 20 years of meditating. You're, you are an, an advanced meditator. And so because you learn certain key pieces of information is what our training is about. For instance, in the case of the hindrances, teaching you exactly how they work. Why would anybody invent the dark night of the soul? <laughs> and have you go online to read about these men who are stuck? I'm not making fun of them. I just wish that I could. I even went to one of their boards once and gave them the quotes from the hindr from the from the suttas to, to where they were and said, "Go and read them." This is the nourishment for the hindrance is your personal careless attention. Sati Pata, uh, no, not, uh, I'm sorry, um, Samyutta Nikaya in the Bojanga Samyutta, page 1591, start reading from there. And you'll get to a discussion, which is a wonderful title in the first paragraph of the discussion is basically the title. This is an examination of the nourishment and the denourishment of a hindrance in direct relationship to the arising or non-arising of the seven enlightenment factors. You can't be clear, more clear than that, okay? So what does it take for each one of the seven enlightenment factors to arise? And what will keep them from ever arising? That's the lesson, okay? And guess what? It's your personal attention. That is the food for the hindrance, yeah. See, one time I had to keep, I told you, I told you, may I taught one time about 35 or 40 retired military personnel. And I thought, what am I gonna do when I walked in the room at all men? all retired military from Asia. So I played a game because I knew some of them, I, knew, I had seen some information about them and I knew it was gonna be a four, four time talk, four parts of the talk about hindrances. And I went, I designed, when I saw who was coming, I just started to design, read, just throw away my notes and design the whole thing based on the art of war. Sun Tzu's book, The Art of War. There are 10 chapters, and there are certain chapters in there about spying on the enemy to learn exactly who they are and to understand how they operate, and that you can't, that the sad part of war, he points out, Sun Tzu points out that the whole point of the book is to have a war and to win the war without a battle. So a lot of the book is how to win and out, outsmart everyone uh, without confronting them, without any losses of life or destruction of resources and land and villages and things like that. That's what he was interested in doing. He was a peer of the Buddha. So you feel maybe they crisscrossed in information some, but same period. And so the, the one thing that was so fascinating about this thing to teach them about the hindrances was that in the art of war, it boils down to, you know, coming around the mountain, we're on the other side and this army is coming around to attack us and we find out they're coming. What can we do? What should we do? And if they're already over here close and ready to attack, if we have a place we can stay where we're safe, uh, the thing we can do to make it so nothing will work for them is to destroy their supply route. Is this not true? To, to destroy their supply route. So if we, and this is this was happening in Laos during the Vietnam conflict, they were always blowing up this road. That's why I remembered this stuff, you know? And so they're always blowing up the road so they can't come in and, and give the Viet Cong this supplies from this one area. They kept destroying the, the supply route is what they kept trying to do. But anyway, the principle is if you destroy the food coming in and take away the food, the water and everything they need in their ammunition, you have them stuck. And then you can let them go and hope they repair the road enough they can go back and not come over and destroy you. But this came about in a time where people were being very sloppy about war in a time of the Buddha and, and, and um, you know, uh, Sun Tzu also, because they were just, you know, 
5,000 here, 5,000 there, bang. And they were stupid. They were doing it at the time they should have been home planting the crops or just before the harvest time came in, they were doing it. They didn't have any guidelines. Just these men were playing with toys, boys and their toys. What can you do? <laughs> boys and their toys grow up, you know? <laughs> and so, so, you know, things haven't changed much in that respect. Boys and their toys, just terrible. Anyway, <laughs> but anyway, the secret to the whole thing he found was to teach them how to outsmart the enemy. And if you took over a country, and I'll tell you who was kind of good at this. He was really rough at the front end, but overall running an empire was um, the Mongols. You know, they, who was it? Genghis Khan was a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant person. The way he figured the communication system, he had the, uh, the Pony Express, you know, he had the Pony Express operating. He had passes through all the countries. It was horrible what they did when they first arrived, but um, but they didn't destroy the uh, resources and they didn't destroy the value of the communities and they flourished into cities and towns over the years that they were under the rule. Now the boys later on, his sons, <laughs> You know, they made a mess of things, but that's life. <laughs> but for, for the Khan himself, if you look into the organization of it, you should read about, um, who was it who came from Italy? You know, he went with his father and got stuck over there. Who is it? He, who am I thinking of, May? It was, um, gosh, I'll think of it tomorrow. Marco Polo. <laughs> who is it? Marco Polo. There you go, Marco Polo. And that's why I'm here, okay? <laughs> Marco Polo and you know he he gets over there he was sucked into the con system and was working a lot with him and was there for a number of years he really understood and he wrote about it when he went back and of course nobody believed him and that was another story so anyway we're done are we done is everybody happy <laughs> anybody here have any questions anybody else Sarah you have a question no? Okay. How's your leg? I want to ask you, you, how's your leg doing? Um, Better? Uh, the, yeah, the, the swelling's gone down and um, it's looking a lot more <laughs> angry, but it's uh, not healing at the moment. So they're looking into that. Oh, what a mess. I'm so sorry. Yeah, to go so. Uh, yeah well, things come up. I'm going to go right. through a mess, yeah. mess too. Mess is like part of life. It was life and then there was the mess. <laughs> then life again, then more mess. But the water came. The water came. <laughs> the water came. You know how excited I get about the water. Anyway, so let's say a prayer and we will let this go. And I will see you guys or any of you who want to come to the Wednesday class. We'll do, we're going to try to continue a Wednesday class. I tell you one thing before we stop. Uh, first retreat over here is from the 16th to the 26th, I think, 16 to 26. And I'm not sure, but I think there might be 14 people in that. That's all part of the organization, so it's not an open retreat. I'm in Poland right now, and I'm in Gdansk, near Gdansk, sort of near it, 15 minutes away from the neat part downtown. But anyway, we're, we're in a nice spot. And um, so I'm here and safe. and. Um, yeah, also investigating a mess that's a health mess <laughs> and having fun discovering all of that too. So, um, yeah, so everything is going well. There's food, there are really interested people in what we're trying to do, and um, we'll see what happens with all of this. We're very excited about it right now. Um, this is a thing with world class uh, life coaches, and that all these people coming are either students of the coaches or coaches that want to be coaches and stuff like that. And so it's a way, and they're coming from, I think, six countries or seven countries to this point, which is sort of a central point in Europe. And uh, so that's where I am right now. And then back in India right now, uh, Damagavesi is working on the second retreat. I think he's going through a second retreat. Um, and the first retreat he did went really well. And now he's back at Jetwan Monastery doing a retreat. And then we'll see what comes up next as we go along step by step. And then you know that I'll be back over there. Um, I will go back the end of August and um, go back over into India 
And then in September, I'm supposed to co-teach a retreat. This is real interesting how it's all going to work, but we're talking about it. I'm co-teaching a retreat uh, with, um, I like to say, Acharya Sobhana. Now they're trying Acharya Sobhana, see if they can do that one. <laughs> Dhammacharya means teacher of the Dhamma. So I'm a Dhammacharya. You're a Dhammacharya. We're all done. <laughs> you know, Dhammacharya. And I don't use Acharya. I... I, everybody knows the title I keep is the one that the head of Bangladesh gave me. And that was Sasana Dipika. I'm very happy being the little light of the Sangha. <laughs> That's my little title, Sasana Dipika. So that you hear that comes, I went, took that home to the United States uh, and everybody laughed at it and said, who ever heard of that? What's that? And I, I didn't even answer it because in America, the problem is we're the ones that threw the king out. <laughs> So we don't want to have anybody say they're sir or lady this or that or anything. We don't really want to see any titles even to this day floating around in the United States. So they didn't really think it was, you know, even kosher. And I'm there like, it's fine. It's something that was given to me for Asia. Very effective, you know, but um, it's, you know, someday you should come and listen to us talk about names, Perry. It's really funny how names happen in Buddhism with monastics. It's a real hoot. I should make a comedy routine out of this and we should give it to Jerry Seinfeld. He should give it to Kramer and he should do it because <laughs> it's a real hoot going from country to country to country. What venerable sir means this, all these different words. And then when the women came, what they say and what he says and what who says and it's really funny. I couldn't even keep track of it for Bonte. If you knew Bonte's whole name, you would run away. <laughs> You'd go across the whole screen if I told you all the pieces that he's been given over the years. But that's just another story. So let's say our prayer. And this was a fun time. Thank you. Um, okay. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, sister. Thank you. Bye-bye.